being for 35 years on stage, more than 35 years, how does it feel? What make it, makes you continue the, this, this thing? Well, how does it feel? Well, my fucking back hurts. <laughs> I have a headache. I, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, there's a, a few elements that are necessary to do this correctly, or at least correctly for myself. And that is one, don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, two, do everything in moderation. And three, explode in the moment. And I think if a person can explode in the moment, treat the moment as the most important part of, let's say, their work or their career, uh, for instance, today being Hellfest, this is my most important moment. I'm going to personally get good results out of what I do, and I'm going to make the most of my opportunities. So how does it feel? It feels fucking great to have more opportunities that are still coming in my direction. And how you see the scene after so many years in regards to new bands, old bands that stop existing and afterwards reuniting and all those type of things. How do you see the stage actually after all these years? I, you know, I, I, I've seen the, the, the metal scene or specifically the thrash metal genre uh, go like so uh, through uh, those three decades. When I first was involved in it, it was uh, the, the most interesting thing was that there was no rules. It was just being created, you know, uh, not with any type of a plan and not as myself as the creator of it. But I was involved in part of that creation because it, it really didn't even have a genre name at, at that point. And I think that it was kind of cool that it was uh, something so new at that particular time. Now, when I look back on that uh, uh, 35 years later, I say to myself, wow, what great fucking value that those principles uh, had that were created back in the 80s, because they still have value today. That there's older bands like myself or like Testament that are here, like Anthrax, that are still doing what they do, much like they did in the 80s. And newer bands like Havoc, I saw here and some of the other bands that are that are younger bands so that value has transcended let's say almost two or three generations so how do I see it I see it as strong I see it as healthy and I see it as something that has uh, the value that's hard to dispose of and that makes me uh, quite happy inside uh, talking about the new generations of bands you told me about Havoc uh, are you still listening to new bands trying to discover new artists and if any band attracted atten attention to you, what's that band? Well, you know, I think that somewhere in, <clears throat> somewhere about 2010 era, which was uh, Ironbound, uh, I think we realized that taking packages out were the right thing to do. And it gave me the opportunity back then to start exposing myself to, to younger bands. And, and the reason so was because we thought younger bands uh, with us would, as a business move, would help increase our popularity with the younger fans. So there was the Suicide Angels, and there was uh, Evile back then, and there was uh, uh, Warbringer, uh, et cetera, et cetera, Gamma Bomb. And we would take these bands out with us. And this was how I started becoming exposed to that, let's say, that newer scene of Thresh. So for me, it was kind of cool to see some of the principles that I was involved in back in the 80s being held up today. I mean, visually as well as audibly. You know, I mean, some of these guys are wearing exactly the same uniform that we wore back then, you know, the high top white sneakers. And we were out with Lost Society. We took them out, right? And I was like, God, they look like Overkill looked when, in 1986, you know, you know, that kind of a thing. So I do think it's kind of cool to be exposed to it and at least keep my finger on the pulse of it because I'm part of it. It's not just, it's not ever about what we were. It's always about what we are, you know, and, and that principle is what keeps us relevant in, you know, 2016, what we are. So the new bands too are, are, are part of the, the, the modern day uh, thrash scene. So, so I'm aware, yes. And about the fans, how would you describe a Overkill fan nowadays and how were they back in the day? You've never heard the old joke? What has 2,000 legs and two tits? Overkill live in Germany. <laughs> I think it's, I think obviously it's, uh, you know, music kind of transcends generation. It's really about emotion. And emotions never change. 
So how to describe the fan is to say that if we can still strike that same emotional chord that we were able to strike in 1986, that becomes the commonality that wipes out the fact that age is the difference between, let's say, the performer and the audience. So I do see a lot of younger people that are into this, and I, and I give them the credit for keeping this alive. It's not, about, it's not about the scene's greatness for it. It's about the hunger that youth has to keep it great. That's where it comes from. You know, you can get th I can get thanked by an 18-year-old fan, but really I'm the one who should be thanking him because I'm here because of his hunger for this. So I think that there's a, a, a difference, of course, because of age, the obvious visual dis uh, difference, but when it comes to emotional difference between 1985 and 2016, there's none. It, it's exactly the same. Emotion is emotion. And you, you find the band more easier to be discovered because of the internet I mean indeed the fans are not buying too many albums nowadays but how do you find the internet actually in comparison with back in the day well back in the day there was obviously no internet this uh, the, the internet was invented while overkill was existing we existed for instance prior to the World Wide Web now <clears throat> I think it's a double-edged sword. I think that, sure, it's great to have that type of exposure and instant information, and it makes the world smaller. These are, you know, these are just obvious uh, qualities that it has. But I do think it's given people, you know, you know one of the things that, that social media has done has gotten so many people to think along an exact line or parallel line. There are none of this, there's none of this anymore. There's no uh, opposite thinking. Whether you're a, a metal fan or a thrash fan or a pop fan or a jazz fan, the internet provides you with what you want. You consider it to be something that is, it's not just a necessity, it's just the way it should be. Free is the way it should be. <laughs> of course, all my friends think that way too. Does it make it right? It doesn't make it right. And it actually does hurt the scene. So you have to find ways to reinvent yourself. So instead of complaining about it, I look at it more as saying, okay, we have to reinvent. We have to partner with the right people. We have to focus on, uh, as business people, focus on uh, our market. Who's the collectors? Who wants the vinyl? Who wants this? So you have to think differently to be able to survive in the age of the internet. Because the internet will be really one of the reasons that this scene eventually will go away. It chips away at it continuously. It just eats it away and eats it away. It gives you great promotion, but on a slow, slow process, it's eating the scene. So, so you think it will disappear sometimes well, I, sooner I, or later? Th there'll always be a want for that emotional chord to be struck. But with regard to all your favorite bands, eventually they'll just have to go away. And that'll have nothing to do with age. That'll have to do with, we just can't do this anymore. We just can't do this anymore. It's just not possible to do this and eat. <laughs> and everybody will say, oh, that's just too bad. But they become the reason for it. That's, that's really part of the reason. So. It's reinventing yourself, it's figuring out ways to get YouTube to up their royalties, it's getting Spotify to up their royalties, Google Play, et cetera, et cetera. So from the business perspective, I think it's reinventing. And I'm, I'm not concerned with regard to the result. I'm more about living in this particular moment. I'm not looking forward to the, my future. My future is in, in, in two hours on that stage. That's where I, I'd rather concentrate my efforts because it's really a fruitless effort to say, oh, this sucks and that sucks and I should have more. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that it's slowly eating it away at, uh, and weakening it at uh, places that it shouldn't be. Uh, and, and only because of uh, common opinion, that's all. Talk, talking about the present, uh, how do you see Hellfest and what are your expectations for tonight's show? You know, it's funny, I, I, you know, this many years doing this, you, you'd think I wouldn't get nervous before shows, but I still do. And I, and it's, I know, I know for myself that because of that, uh, it means it's valuable to me. Um, if it was, yeah, whatever, then it's not, then it's not as valuable. But if my stomach starts turning upside down and I start sweating before the show, I know that the thing, things are right. So I expect that. That's really what I expect to happen. And when you're in that position, you feel like you have to work harder. And I think it's one of the things I'm most proud about this band is that we've always worked harder. 
this is not a band that has ever sat back and said, yeah, whatever. Yeah, we did a good record here. We did a good record there. We did a good show over in Romania. Oh, yeah, Hellfest. What? It's never like that. It's always go out there and fucking rip their fucking heads off. And if you can take that attitude from day to day, you're going to have some great successes. And that's how I kind of feel today. And for the future plans, what's the plan for Overkill for next month, next year? Any idea about maybe a new album touring more in Eastern Europe or in Romania? Well, there's always plans, you know. I mean, that's not, you know, that's the, the the point is that you know when you stop making plans, you really stop breathing, you know. I mean, that's the the idea. That's that's part of the process. Uh, the new record comes out in uh, October of 2016. The drums, guitars are done. Uh, Didi's uh, gearing up to do the bass as soon as we get home. I should be singing by July 1st. Andy Sneep will be mixing it. We'll do the production. This is kind of the way we work on those schedules, you know, by pushing and pushing and pushing. Uh, with regard to touring, we've already put together a European tour. I didn't see Romania on that tour, but it most certainly doesn't mean that that can't happen. And understand this, this has nothing to do with the band. The band don't choose to go there or not. It's about partnerships with promoters. And if we talked about the internet earlier, eating away this, I'm not gonna, I will never let promoters eat away. <laughs> you understand? And you start letting too many people take bites out, then there is nothing left. So I think that being self-managed as we are, that we understand the business part of it. And I, it's sometimes better to say no than yes. But I do hope that it happens. It's not that I don't have hope. And the last message for the people that are watching the interview. Hey, what do you say, Romania? This is Bobby Blitzum Overkill. That's right. We're at Hellfest today. That's where you should be. We'll see you soon.